So I've been telling you, we're about to wrap up this First Peter section next week. <laughs> next week is our last week. It's our last sermon in First Peter. And then we're going into uh, the book of James. There's a lot of Jameses out there. Hey, that's for y'all. Uh, no, just kidding. Um, yeah, we're going to get into uh, James. James goes further into this thing of the Christian life and what it should look like, how we should behave, what we should do, what we shouldn't do, um, all that kind of stuff. So it's further coaching in our walk uh, with the Lord and, and further refining. Uh, we, we, James echoes some of the same things that Peter is talking about uh, when the fiery trial comes, right? Don't be surprised. There's suffering that comes along with this Christian life for many reasons. Some of it we cause ourselves. We make dumb choices. And so there is natural consequences for the choices that we make. The enemy is on the prowl. Uh, this world is broken. It's, you know, earthquakes, storms, all kind of stuff going on, so, and sickness, so that has something to do uh, with that also. So, all kinds of reasons why suffering occurs in our life, but here's the assurance, here is the hope, is that the Lord uses it for our own good. Isn't that great? So, enough suffering of going through First Peter, right? <laughs> Next week, we wrap it up, okay? Um, and then we'll, we'll get into uh, the book of James. Today, we will be concentrating on verses 10 and 11 of 1 Peter chapter 5. But we'll, we'll go back a, a little bit and, um, and to verse 6. We'll start from verse 6, and then we'll concentrate mainly on verses 10 and 11. Um, Let's just read, get into the word. Let's get to work. Um, starting at verse 6. <clears throat> Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the opportunity to gather together today that you give us this day, God. You give us this day. We are promised right now to come and to worship and to honor you and we bring our sacrifices of praise. Lord, be with us this morning as we listen, God, that, that that would be worship also, that we willingly submit to your word, God. Shape us, mold us, help us to mature into the type of people that you would have us be. Be with us. Give us discernment this morning, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you're visiting with us this morning, which I've, I have family, and they are visiting. My, my brother and my sister-in-law are in from Washington. And then my mom and dad are here again. Uh, they were here last week. Um, <clears throat> but if there are other visitors, thank you for being with us this morning. We are glad that you're worshiping with us this morning. Um, we are going through this series uh, in First Peter. We, we've been going at it for a few months, right? Not, not that long. Just a couple of months. Um, but we're wrapping it up next week, as I said before. And Peter is giving us instruction on how we are to relate with each other within our family uh, circle, how we should relate to the government, 
around us, how we should, uh, within a marriage, how we should interact, right? And how we ought to submit to the authority of the church. Oh, silence. Man, that was awesome. That was great. I wish I could take a picture. Anyway, um, <clears throat> and he goes and further instructs us on how we should live our life. There is suffering, right, that we must go through. As a Christian, okay, we've got sickness. There, there's all kind of reasons, like, like we explained before, why we suffer, why we experience pain, and why we go through hard times. The suffering that Peter is talking about is the suffering that we do because of Christ, because we put ourselves out there and, and we stand firm in our faith, in, the, in our surrounding society, in our surrounding environment. And it's... Jesus says, they didn't love me. They're not going to love you. They, they hated me. They will hate you. So as Christians, as followers of Jesus Christ, the same sort of things we ought to be experiencing. It's a little easier here where we are in, in this place on earth. There's other places where folks suffer persecution and death because of their faith. But what Peter is talking about is you will, as a Christian, experience suffering. If you're making the stance that you ought to make there will be some stuff, some baggage that comes along with your claim. But it's also a, a way of examining ourselves. When we look at the scriptures, and, the, and it describes what a Christian life should look like, and we look at our own life, and then the description... It brings, it should bring some conviction to our life. Not because you're trying to earn anything. We can't earn it. We can't earn God's favor. It's his grace and his mercy toward us that we can even take part, right? Grace is unmerited favor. You've done nothing to be shown the love that he is showing you. And there is nothing that you can do to earn it. Mercy. Mercy is we do not get what we ought to get. What do we deserve? I point down, but it's just the floor. But you know what I'm talking about, right? That's what we deserve. But we get him. We get him for all eternity. Amen? I'm always going to look over here when I need an amen. <laughs> By the way, I learned that from VeggieTales, the difference between grace and mercy. Just putting it out there. Verse 9. Resist him firm in your faith. The faith that brings peace. That lets us know I'm going to backtrack just a, a little bit. Because Peter is saying in verse 8 be sober minded. Be watchful. That means that the world and how it operates, and how we function within it is important. But in the timeline of eternity, it's a speck. It matters. And how we live our life here will determine the timeline. Well, there's no timeline. It determines eternity for us. We will be eternal 
It's just, where will we spend eternity? So, sober-minded, resist him, the enemy, your adversary, the roaring lion, looking, prowling around, looking for someone to devour. Resist him. Firm in your faith, the faith that the Lord has put in you, that he has convinced you that this thing is legitimate, right? And that he is so great and that he deserves our worship and our adoration. He is so magnificent. He is so great. He deserves every bit of our attention. Firm in that faith, knowing that it doesn't matter what we go through, it is well worth it if we are on his team, if we are part of his family, part of that royal priesthood. Stand firm in that faith, knowing that the same kind of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. We talked about this last week, but we may have to stretch it another week. I don't know. <clears throat> knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. Sometimes when we go through some stuff, we think, why me? Like, only me. This is, oh, my life is terrible. I hear this often, and it makes me laugh. You're not a snowflake, all right? You're not unique. There's not something that's going on in your world that hasn't happened in the history of the world. There are others within the brotherhood that have gone through the same things. And the Lord, and here, here's where the hope comes from, is that the Lord has carried them through those experiences. Isn't that magnificent? Like, it's awesome. It's awesome is not even, that doesn't even come close. It's rejoice in your suffering. That kind of knowledge brings joy in the middle of our suffering. God is faithful, and he will see us through. Knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. Do you know that your brotherhood stretches further than these walls? I'm tempted to go. No, I won't today. Man, I've got a packed day already. <clears throat> we'll get into that later. And after you have suffered a little while, the song, no more crying there, right? No more suffering, no more pain. We are going to see the king. When? Soon and very soon. After a little while. Not right now. After a little while. What does a little while mean? In, so we see this in verse 5 of First Peter, but it's also in chapter 1 of First Peter. We see it in, sorry, in chapter 5, we see it, but we also see it in chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. How long is a little while? In verse 6, in this you rejoice Though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ, at the completion and <clears throat> the completion of this is at the revelation of Jesus Christ. How long is a little while? Our lifetime. It's a lifetime. So long as you are breathing, that little while continues. 
How does that feel? It's not going to end. We may go from this trial to the next trial and to the next trial until we've been refined so that the tested genuineness of your faith may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We go through these things to be refined so that our faith may grow so that when Jesus Christ is revealed, it is worthy of praise, worthy of honor. Our life, when he is revealed, is like praising him. We are honoring him through the genuinely tested faith when he comes. How much is a little while? Soon and very soon. When, when, when the pain is there, when the suffering is there, when the oppression is there, we want it to end right there. We're like, man, I want to be done with this. Peter is saying, hold on. This is for your own good. All the corrupted thoughts that we have because of the world influence on us, what we treasure, what we hope in, what the dreams that we might have. If it's influenced by the world, it's corrupted. And so it takes a lifetime to grow, to set those things aside and focus on him, his glory, his grace, and kingdom work. Everything else. If it doesn't point to Jesus, if it doesn't glorify his name, it needs to be cleansed. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ. God of all grace. Sometimes we look at grace as the good things in our life. But remember, our thoughts are not his thoughts. Sometimes Grace hurts. But it's shaping you. It's shaping us. It's molding us. To be more and more dependent on him. The God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore or perfect. When there is brokenness in our life, things that have affected us in a certain way, that have shaped us and our attitude and how we behave and the things that we do and the addictions that there might be, the behavior there are things within our life that have an influence on us. When the Lord intervenes, he restores. And so the rest of our life, he is restoring us into the type of people that we ought to be. Perfection will come at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Then we will have arrived. When we arrive, we will have arrived. It's a little redundant, but you get what I'm saying, right? While we're still here, we're still a work in progress. 
But he's restoring. He is healing. He's taking care of us. No one can restore like he can. And you're not a special case. You're not a Humpty Dumpty, okay? That all the king's men, and what, they couldn't back, put him back together again. The Lord can put you back together again. You're not a special case that, oh, you don't know me. You don't know what I've gone through. You don't know what I've done. If you knew, the Lord knows you. Knows every cell on your body, every thought that you have. And right now, he's showing grace upon you and delivering this message, his gospel, and letting you know, even with what you have done and what you have gone through, he wants you to be a part of his family. The God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore and confirm. He will set you on a firm foundation. The enemy, like we talked about, is on the prowl. And he's got all kind of methods, right? For those that are Christians, to make them ineffective. For those that are not, to keep them down. Because he's not going to be reigning in hell. He's going to be suffering for eternity, but he wants to take some people down with him. And so he uses all kinds of different things to lure people. And sometimes... He uses truth with just enough lies. But if the Lord confirms and firms you up in his word, right? This is the sword. This is the only weapon that we have. Everything else, the whole armor of God, it's defensive. We've got a shield, helmet, shoes. We have one weapon. That is the word of God. He will himself restore, confirm, and strengthen. As we're going through stuff, he strengthens us. Not in our abilities, all right? Not because we're so great, because we're such great Christians that we can't boast about that. He is the one that carries us through. We are strengthened in recognizing that we are weak. Because it's his strength. He's the one that holds us up. He's the one that carries us through. Restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish. In Psalm 1, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Meditate day and night on his word. What is he like? He is like a tree planted by streams of water. We have a flowing, life-giving source. He is like a tree planted by the streams of water that yields its fruit in its seasons, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so.
he will establish you by those streams. He will establish us by that living water. We have to submit. We have to submit to his authority, to his dominion, to his glory. We have to get to the place where we have no reservations. We're not going to be like Jonah and say, no, not those people. Okay? We set limits and say, eh, just that far, Lord. That kind of thought pattern doesn't make any sense when we're talking about the king of kings. You don't put boundaries on him. You don't, you don't say only this far. To the king of kings, you say, whatever and whenever. For your glory, because I recognize how great you are, God, and I want to be a part of whatever it is that you're doing. I'm getting loud again. To him be dominion forever and ever. Amen. When we don't hear a lot of amens, that means that you've been hearing truth and you are convinced that this is truth and you agree with it. So the amen is an agreement with what you just heard. To him be dominion forever and ever. Ooh, we can do better than that. To him be dominion forever and ever. Yeah. yeah. He has all glory and all dominion. Everything is his. And we agree with that. And we submit to that. And we say, God, you lead. The Christian life is not about you. It's not about me. Well, if it's not about, the, about me and the 10 best ways on how to get wherever, what's it about? It's about his glory. His glory. His name and his fame. His kingdom. We are allowed. Think on this. We are allowed to take part. Sometimes when we come to something, you know, we're included into something, we think we have something to contribute, right? You're allowed to take part. Allowed into the royal priesthood. Because he is gracious and merciful. He gives us more, much more than we deserve. And what we do, we don't get. Because he's such a loving God. So we need to think with a sober mind. That every action from one moment to the next, we need to think sober. We need to be sober. We need to be watchful. Because the enemy prowls, seeking someone to devour, someone to take down, or someone to make ineffective. And he works hard at it. And he's got his ways. And he is dangerous. Don't dismiss him like he has no power. He has power. But he has limited power. Jesus talked about the devil as the ruler of this world to a certain point. He is only allowed to do what God permits. 
and he's dangerous. But who do we serve? We heard it in that song, right? The Lion of Judah. No one defeats him. He's already won. I don't know if you've read to the end of the book. I don't know if you know this end of the story, but he has already won. And for those of us that are a part of the family of God, we have won also. It's done. It's a done deal. Now what are we going to do? All right? We, we've gone through, right, the amen. To him be dominion forever and ever. Amen. 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 We all agree, right? It's his dominion, his glory. It's not about me. It's not about you. So what are we going to do for the kingdom of God? The proper response would be whatever it takes. But I didn't, I didn't clue you in on that. So what are we going to do? Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for your word, God, and the conviction that it brings upon us, that it would not be shaken off, Lord. And you would be working on us throughout the week. What can we be doing for your glory, God? Not for us, not for our own preferences. Help us to set those preferences aside, God. And to do everything that we possibly can to further your kingdom. To be obedient. To tell people about you. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.